want to encourage you to grab your copy of God's Word and uh, find Acts chapter 14. And today we're going to begin our worship a little bit early with the reading of God's Word, Acts chapter 14. And uh, the text will be up on the scripture, the scripture text will be up on the screen in the Holman translation. But uh, turn to Acts chapter 14. Cam, one of our teenagers, is going to read this for us. So let's just pray and prepare for the reading of God's Word. Lord God, I pray that you would bless us today as we worship you, as we sing songs to you, as we lift up your holy, inerrant, infallible word, as we reflect on our lives and we reflect on what you have to say about our lives. Lord, I pray that you bless Cam as he reads this chapter of Scripture. Amen. <clears throat> the same thing happened at Iconium. They entered the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against the brothers. So they stayed there for some time and spoke boldly in reliance on, on the Lord, who testified to the message of his grace by granting that signs and wonders be performed through them. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to assault and stone them, they found out about it and fled to the Lyc Lyconian towns called Lystra and Derby to the surrounding countryside. And, and there they kept evangelizing. And Lystra, a man without strength in his feet, lame from birth, and who had never walked, sat, <clears throat> and heard Paul speaking. After observing him closely and seeing that he had, had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he jumped up and started walking around. When the crowd saw that Paul had, what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lycosian language, the gods, the gods have come down to us from in the form of men. <clears throat> and they started to call Barnabas, Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because they had, because he was the main speaker. And the priest, and the priest of Zeus, whose temple was outside of the town brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He, with the crowds, intended to offer sacrifice. The apostles Barnabas and Paul tore their robes when they heard this and rushed to the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing these things? We are men also, with the same nature as you, and we are proclaiming the good news to you that you should turn from these worthless things to be living to the living God who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In the past generations, he's allowed all the nations to go on their way. Although he did not leave himself without witness since, he did good, giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, and satisfying your hearts with food and happiness. Even though they did these things, they barely stopped, they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing to them. And some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, when they had won over the crowds and stoned Paul, they dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. And the disciples surrounded him, and he got up and went into the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. After they had evangelized that town and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening their hearts of the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith and by telling them it is necessary to pass through many troubles on our way into the kingdom of God. When they had appointed the elders in every church, they pray and prayed and and prayed and with fasting, they committed to they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They they then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia where they had spoke the message in Perga, they went to, they went down to Attilia. From there they sailed back to Antioch where they had been entrusted 
to the grace of God for the work they had completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything that God had done with them and, they, and that he had opened the door of the faith to the Gentiles. They, and, then, and they spoke a considerable time with the disciples. sing with us.
God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the love that you have lavished out on each and every one of us. And today we say, praise God. Praise God. You are worthy of it. And Lord, I pray that you would be pleased today with what we present to you, that we wouldn't give you um, half of what you want. We wouldn't give you second best. We wouldn't sacrifice uh, that, that lame, uh, blind uh, animal, to, thinking of the Old Testament. Lord, help us to give you our best. Help us to give you the best of what we have, the best of our, our resources, the best of, of our, our singing, the best of ourselves, the best of our lives. We love you, Lord. We pray that you would meet with us today and, and anoint this, this special time where we come together as a church family in your name. Be pleased, we pray, Lord, with our faith. Lord, I pray that you would touch the one who's hurting. I pray that you would heal the one who's sick. I pray that you'd save the one who's lost. And Lord, we just commit our entire lives to you. We commit our, our church to you, all the dozens of ministries in our church. But Lord, today, right now, we, can, we commit this special time of worship to you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning. Thank you for being with us here today at Kingsland. And uh, if you're here for the first time, there's a little information thing here in the bulletin that you can fill out. And uh, you can give it to our, our wonderful folks at our greeter information welcome booth back there or you, or welcome desk in the foyer or you can just put in the offering plate when it goes by in a little bit. We're just thankful that you would worship with us. We have a lot going on at Kingsland. Um, next Sunday is Palm Sunday and next Sunday we start Operation Chesterfield which has been very much narrowed down and reduced to just a couple different things. We'll, we'll have a prayer team and we'll have canvassing teams. Lots and lots of folks have signed up for that. Hopefully if you haven't yet you will today before you leave. We're going to mobilize we're going to get out into our community, and we're going to invite everybody to our block party. And uh, our block party is at the Iron Bridge Sports Park on April 7th, Saturday, April 7th, big humongous Easter egg hunt uh, at the block party, uh, bounce houses, all kinds of cool stuff going on. Uh, anybody that is listening on the, the cable show, April 7th, Iron Bridge Sports Park, 1 o'clock. It's in the Village News. We've sent out 2,000 uh, homes. We, we, we've invited an awful lot of people to come to this thing. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then on Easter Sunday morning, April 8th, we'll be across the street in our Family Life Center. We're hoping for a huge, huge turnout. Everybody that comes to the block party, we'll get a little ticket inviting them to come and have uh, to be with us on, on Easter morning. Uh, we'll do uh, a donuts and so forth and coffee uh, before the service and then have a big time on Easter Sunday morning. And uh, it's going to be great. So everybody Pick up some of those invitations. There's literally hundreds of them in the foyer. There should be one in your bulletin. Pray about who God wants you to invite. Pray about God touching our church and using this as a, a, an instigator for growth in our church. And as we prepare for next Sunday, you know, what did they do on Palm Sunday? They took those, those branches, they laid them out before the Lord, and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, and we'll sing that next Sunday. We're going to sing it now, too. Hosanna, which means, Lord, save us. Come save us. I love this song. This is a song we've done a, a time or two or has been done here. And my favorite part, be looking for this in this song as we sing, it says, Lord, break my heart for what break you, breaks yours. Man, holiness is a lost art in America and even in the church, isn't it? Today, as we prepare to this, sing this song, as we say Hosanna in the highest, and we worship you and we praise you, we also want to say, Lord, break my heart for the things in my life that displease you. Make me more like you. So with that in mind, I want to ask you to stand with me Let's sing with all our hearts to the glory of God.
have a seat. Go ahead and sit down. For the last uh, 13 years, the senior group here at Kingsland, the Silver Saints, they've sponsored a uh, Valentine's for Veterans campaign in January and in February. And this year we collected over 300 uh, plus Valentines that we took over to McGuire Hospital. And I've received a letter back from them, and it's, it's a short letter, but I'd like to read it to you before we pray. Dear members, this is at Kingsland Baptist Church. On behalf of the Richmond VA Hunter H. McGuire patients and staff, we would like to extend our appreciation to you for your donation of Valentine's Day cards received on February 13th. Your thoughtfulness reflects the concern that you feel for our veterans and for the service they provided to all of us while in service to our country. Without your support, we could not provide for the smaller niceties that make hospitalization more bearable. Your thoughtfulness also reflects the concern and compassion that our community feels for our veterans. Thank you for your continued support. Janet S. Langhorn, Chief Voluntary Services. So I just want to make you aware of it that they do appreciate the Valentines that you that, they, that we bring to them each year, and for the last several years it's been over 300 each each year. So just keep up the good work. Let's pray. pray. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us for loving us, Lord. Although we don't always deserve your love, and Father, we just thank you that you give us the many blessings. You're such a loving all-knowing, all-powerful God that is there for us when we need you to comfort us, give us patience, 
in dealing with our problems. And Father, we thank you for loving us and for being there for us and being there to bring us back when we stumble and fall back. Be there to pick us up when we fall down, Lord. And we just love you for it. And now as we return a portion of these blessings to you through our tithes and our offerings, I pray that they will be used in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless this church as you have for the past hundred plus years. Bless our pastor, pastors Pat and Derek. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
네. Thank you so much, Rita Meunier. That was beautiful. Thank you, Cam, for reading the scripture today. Thank you, Youth Band, for leading us in the singing. Weren't they great? Do you appreciate our youth singing, using their gifts for the Lord? Before I get started, how many of you just love to get your picture made? Anybody? Anybody? I hate it. Ugh. Who hates to get their picture made? You might want to hide under a pew. Tell you what, Steve Dance is going to come up on stage. He's going to take a picture of us, okay? And, and he doesn't have a wide lens, so those of you on this side, if you want to scooch in, like when you stand up with me, let's stand up. And if you're on the edge, come on in a little bit, and uh, we'll all get in the picture, okay? Don't forget the balcony. Y'all count two. Stand up, balcony. We're with you. Don't, don't anybody do anything silly or weird. All right. Okay, stay still. Stay still. You're moving around too much. We're good. Right where you are. Let's do this thing. No bunny ears. All right. Thank you, Chris, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Our, our church directory committee is hard at work putting together the directory, and these are some pictures we needed for that. And um, thank you, Beth Buckwalter and all the team that's involved in that. Take your Bibles and locate Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. And um, in this text, we will read it. It says that Paul completes his mission. Paul and Barnabas complete their mission. And I, I just have been motivated by that all week. So I thought, man, how much, long, how much longer do I have on my mission? Have you, ever, have you ever given your child a job to do and they didn't complete it? Anybody? Anybody? Have you ever been given a job to do but you didn't complete it? Yeah, let's be honest. Sometimes we don't. I remember my first job when I was a little guy, I forgot how old I was. I'm sure it was breaking some sort of federal uh, child working law or whatever. But they paid me to pull weeds out of the cracks in, in the, in the, all over the, the property at the, at, at the organization there that we were in, and uh, man, I love that, I, I've saved all that money, I was a hoarder, anytime I got money, I'd save it, and, um, and, and then I, I went and bought a bicycle with it, so I, I mean, not just that little bit, a lot of them put it all together and got a bicycle, but my father, I remember doing that job, my dad saying, don't start it if you're not going to finish it, you're going to work hard, you're going to stay, I remember just being a little guy going, yes sir, yes sir, dad, I mean, if you're going to start the job, you better finish it, complete the mission. Well, in this text, in Acts chapter 14, we see that Paul and Barnabas and his companions complete the mission. You know, God will give you everything you need to successfully complete the mission that he has for your life. That should encourage you. How many more years do you have to do your mission? How many more years do I have to do my mission? Um, we don't know. We don't know. If all goes well and we live to, to be a, a ripe old age, maybe, you know, however many years that is. Jesus can come back tomorrow, and it's over. It's encouraging to know that God is going to give us every single thing we need. He will give you everything you need to complete the mission that he's given you. In other words, he's not asking anything from you that, you, you know, if he made you five foot two and, and you're, he didn't make you to dunk a basketball, don't sweat it, not a problem. If he, if he gave you skills with math but not with English, you know, you don't have to write any poems. You don't have to come up and preach any sermons. We're all geared and wired and gifted differently. But he gave you a mission, and he, it, it, now here's the thing. He will give you everything you need to complete your mission that he's given you for you, not someone else's mission, and not whatever it is that you feel like doing. We can't just say, oh, here's what I'm thinking, and boom, just, just transpose that on, on to God and somehow pretend that, that, you know, it's his fault that we didn't, maybe he didn't want that for you. He's God, he's sovereign, he's in control. So in this text, which, which Cam has already read for us, we won't read the whole thing, but we see that Paul suffered tremendously on his first missionary journey. He suffered big time. He was, he was really, really brutalized, and he nearly even lost his life. He and those who accompanied him fulfilled their vital tasks. They completed their mission. They were willing to forsake everything. They were willing to risk their lives. They were willing to risk their, their money. Their, they left their families, all to take the, the, the gospel to people who'd never heard it. Up there, and in, in, in today, he'll finish doing a little lap there around Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Listen, starting is easy to some extent. There's some things that even starting are tough, but starting is generally easy. Finishing is not. Finishing is grueling. Finishing is more difficult, but it is also extremely rewarding. If you've ever built anything, if you've ever, whenever you've completed a task, you know what that's like. 
And in these first three verses, which we'll read again, we see this. If you're taking, taking notes, write this down. If you want to successfully complete your mission, if you want to do that, you need to go wherever God leads you to go. Go wherever God leads you to go. And, and you can just write there in that little parentheses, obedience, obedience. In, ver, in chapter 14, are you there? Verse 1, the same thing happened in Iconium. What same thing? The same thing that happened in Antioch. They got run out of town, the religious Jews. Got them in a whole lot of trouble. They entered the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles and the brothers. So they stayed there for some time and spoke boldly. In the middle of all that, they spoke boldly in reliance on the Lord who testified to the message of his grace by granting signs and wonders be performed through them. Paul and his team travel 90 miles south of Antioch, where we were last week, to Iconium, a major population center. And they start again at the synagogue. And lots of Jews and Greeks come to Christ. But yet, yet again, the religious Jews turn the people against them. It says that they bravely stayed a while longer and they boldly operate in reliance on the Lord, who grant, granted them signs and wonders. What I see here is that we need to go wherever God leads us to go as a church, your family, as, as parents, as individuals. Go wherever God leads you to go. And, and that is just good old-fashioned obedience. Obedience. Obey him. And sometimes where he takes us is uncomfortable. You know, going where God leads you to go. What if that's a job change? What if God leads you to change your job? Well, that'd be tough right now in this economy. That'd be tough. That'd be scary, wouldn't it? Or to change... Um, something in a habit or to start a good habit or to, um, to, to take a mission trip or to talk to somebody or help somebody to start a business. I don't know. What, it could be anything. Go where God leads you to go, knowing that he's going to empower you. And in this text, it says that the, 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 the Jewish leaders turned on them. Have you ever had that happen to you where, where someone turns people against you? It could be a friend who turns on you or an enemy that never liked you in the first place. That's a bad feeling. What do you need to do? Well, go wherever God leads you to go. Obey. Have faith. Trust him. In verse 4, we see that the community is divided. It says, look at verse 4, the people of the city were divided. I want to do a hobby horse on that word divided for a minute and then come back to what I think it means in this text. But let's just talk about division. The community here is divided. The gospel always divides, okay? You're either saved or you're not saved. You either believe in Jesus or you don't believe in Jesus. You're either, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me, or you think that many other paths will lead to heaven. There's no, there's no easy middle ground on these things. And, and, and the gospel in itself is, di, di, is, is a dividing. So therefore, understanding how divisive just the gospel is, and the Bible says it's either this or it's that, it's either wrong or it's right, it's black or it's white, and, and, and knowing that, well, for heaven's sake, we don't need to be any more divisive than the Bible is, right? We don't need to add to it. Division killed their momentum here. It spoils a good thing. It sucks the enthusiasm out of everything. Division, I thought about this. Division, it ruins good churches. Division ruins good teams, good organizations, good companies. It will tear you apart. Division is necessary in the church when doctrinal issues are at stake. That is why the Southern Baptist Conservatives of Virginia exist. That's the denomination we partner with and affiliate with. 550 or 60 other churches all around the state of Virginia that exist because there were certain doctrinal issues where we said, man, the word of God is the word of God. It is not to be questioned or challenged. And, and if you don't believe that, man, you got a problem. And we were willing to fight over that. Willing to fight graciously and lovingly. I mean, we try not to be ugly about it. But there are certain things that are worth taking a very strong doctrinal stand on. But most division in church is over preferential issues. Important issues, but preferential issues. Where one person feels one way, one person feels another way. This would be uh, division over music, volume levels, leadership style, worship style, power struggles. These are important issues. They're not minimizing these. People feel strongly about them for a reason, because they're very important to them. But they are preference issues. And, of course, there are the petty issues. There's very petty issues people fight over, whether it be the color of the carpet or the color of the walls or what to put on the walls or um, the dress code or uh, pews versus chairs, hymn books versus screens. 
whatever it may be. There's a lot of mistrust, miscommunication, misunderstanding. Heard a, um, a story about a neighbor who called his other neighbor in the middle of the night. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. He called his neighbor and said, your, your dog is barking and it's keeping me up. Guy didn't even say anything. It's really strange. The next night, 3 o'clock in the morning, that neighbor called his other neighbor and he said, I don't have a dog. <laughs> so th there's miscommunication going on there. There's misunderstanding going on there. And sometimes miscommunication causes division and mistrust. And we can't let division to seep in and ruin our witness and undermine our efforts to spread the gospel. We're very careful about that. In a church that represents legitimately four different generations, it's always going to be an issue. It's always going to be, it would be almost impossible not to be an issue. We have uh, great-grandparents in their 70s and 80s who have children who are grandparents in their 50s and 60s, who have children who are parents in their 20s and 30s and 40s, who have children in, in the youth group and in, 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 in the children's group. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by that. We've got to get along. We've got to encourage one another. And I would say this. I've, I've thought through this. You owe it to your kids and to your grandkids to fight for doctrine, to fight for the Word of God, to explain them the clear teachings of Scripture. Where the Word of God is very clear, you be very clear. And I think we owe it to the next generation, and you owe it to your kids and your grandkids to fight for the doctrines of the Word of God. And at the same time, not to fight over preferential issues. Now, in this context, in verse 4, it seems clear that the passage is referring to division in the city of Iconium over the acceptance or the rejection of Christianity. The city was divided. Some of them said yes to Jesus. Some of them said no. Some of them embraced it. Some of them rejected it. And it, it's much like the United States of America. is a divided country. Make no mistake about it. We're a divided country. There are those who are, are, are for the things of God, for the word of God, for uh, the, the, and then there are others that think it's a joke. That they, there are those who think that religion is toxic. The Christopher Hitchens group that would say religion is, is, is caused more wars than anything else, and, and, and they lump Christianity along with that. So there's division in our country over this, isn't there? And the idea of neutrality, the ones who said, well, just make it neutral, make the schools neutral, make, make government neutral, and we'll just be neutral. Were the founding fathers neutral? Absolutely not. Was our country, when it was great, neutral? Absolutely not. We stood for, we stood for righteousness. We, we, we stood for what was right. And what you see is uh, the folks that say, well, let's just be neutral. Let's not take a stand. Let's be agnostic. Let's just sort of you know, allow for it but not push it on anybody. What you have is, a, is an agenda there to take God out of everything. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to go wherever God leads us to go and be willing to pay the price. Paul and the others were threatened here. So they take the gospel 20 miles down to Lystra. And they shared the gospel all along the way. They obeyed the Lord by staying sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, just like we need to do. The Holy Spirit guided them each step of the way. That's what we need to do. I have a friend who is, is uh, in Iraq. I should say he's overseas. I'm not 100% sure if he's actually in Iraq right now. He and I used to be roommates. We went to Bible college together. We both graduated, and I, I promptly got a job working in a warehouse, um, and, and that was great. But we both went to seminary, Temple Baptist Seminary together. And we lived, before I got married, we lived in an apartment together. We were totally different. We were he was clean, I was dirty, he was into health and fitness and running, I was into eating ho and laying around watching TV. And, and we, one night we were supposed to go shopping, I'll never forget, we were supposed to go shopping together, which I automatically thought was a little weird, and I didn't show up, I was out on a date with Elizabeth, and he was mad, he was hurt, his feelings were hurt, that I didn't show up shopping. I was like, after that, look, we're not shopping together, you get your stuff, I'll get my stuff. We're totally different kinds of people. He's a war veteran. He had pictures to prove it, he had knives and all that other stuff in his room, and, and um, he, he, he's a, he, he was in the 91 Gulf War. And, but his desire was to go back and to be a chaplain, which he is today. 20 years after the Gulf, the original war, he's back in this war. He's still jumping out of airplanes. He's a chaplain. And Marty just decided he's going to go wherever God calls him to go, regardless of the danger, regardless of the risk, regardless of the sacrifice. He's going to fight for his country, he's gonna, and he's going to stand for his Lord. And, be a, and, be a, and he's led so many soldiers to Christ really a war hero, going wherever God leads you to go. That's obedience. Secondly, well, before we get to that, here's the application. Just take the step of faith that God's telling you to take. Surrender and obey. Number two, expect difficulties on your journey. Expect difficulties on your journey. And if you're filling that little blank there, that's just endure or endurance. Endurance. Obedience, endurance. We should expect difficulties on the journey. Anticipate turbulence. 
Don't be shocked when hard times come. Don't be shocked when someone in your family gets sick. Don't be shocked when someone turns on you. Don't be shocked when they fight against you. Don't be so surprised. That, that's really naive, isn't it? We should be expecting difficulties on the journey. It's going to take endurance. I heard a story about a little boy who was on a plane, and um, they hit, they hit um, turbulence or whatever, and the lady beside him didn't like that at all, and she's getting more and more nervous and sweating. And, and the little boy had a little toy he was playing with, and he was just smiling and playing with this toy, and, and she's getting more and more stressed, and he's having more and more fun, and it's beeping all around. He's just too young to care, and she's just had enough. And she goes, little boy, what is wrong with you? Do you have something going up and down in the turbulence? Why, how can you just sit there and play with your toy? And the little boy responded to her. He said, my daddy's the pilot. So that little boy trusted that his dad had it under control. He was just on a, on a fun journey, knowing the dad had it under control. He completely trusted his dad like little boys do. Man, how do you look at your heavenly father when things get turbulent? Are you willing to expect and accept and even embrace the difficulties that come along? We all know wonderful people who have had to struggle through difficult, difficult challenges. Good people go through bad times, don't they? Health challenges, family challenges, uh, relationship challenges, ministry challenges. Uh, it could be anything, job challenges. Paul is about to get challenged. And it's so sad because sometimes when you have your greatest victory, man, that's when attack comes. You know, Elijah had that great victory on Mark, Mount Carmel with the, with the prophets. And the next thing you knew, that crazy old witch, uh, what's her name? Jezebel was all over him. So when you experience victory, well, Paul experiences a tremendous victory here. Paul heals a lame man in verse 8 through the power of the Holy Spirit, and the people of Lystra are like, that's awesome, man, that's great. In fact, we're going to worship you now. Now, Paul's no dummy. First of all, he didn't want to be worshipped. He gave glory to God. But it was just a couple chapters ago. What happened to Herod when the people worshipped him? Herod, you're like a god. Yes. And what happened to him? He was eating up with worms and he died. So in verse 14, look there, at great risk of disappointing his new fans, Paul explains he is not a god and neither is Barnabas. rut -row. It's going to get real bad for him real quick, okay? Do you realize 2,000 years have come and gone and people are still looking for an idol? They're still looking for a person in our culture to lift up and, and nearly worship. It could be a celebrity, singers, even preachers. Oh, he can do no wrong. Blind loyalty and adulation to athletes, actors, authors, gurus. They want a God other than Jehovah, the God of the scriptures, who they can feel and touch. A God who's like a man who will come and save the day with a new book or a new TV show or a song or a philosophy. Listen, we need to remember that we are created in the, in the image of God not the other way around. Never forget that. We are created in the image of God. He's not created in our, He's not like us, folks. He's God. And we, we're created in his image. That makes us special, certainly more special than the dogs and everything else that the evolutionists want to say we sort of evolved from, which is just a, a, an incredibly silly myth. We are special. We're created in the image of God Almighty. But that, that, it doesn't go the other way around. He's not like us. So Paul gives a quick theology lesson here in verse 15 and following, and the, and the people don't like it. He starts off with creation. Look there. Turn to the living God. Do you see that? Turn to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in it. Isn't it interesting? He starts with creation. He starts with creation and repentance. Turn to the living God who made every, heaven and earth and everything in it. It appears that Paul was only halfway through his speech when he's interrupted, and things get very ugly very fast. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19 and um, 20. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they had won over the crowds, they stoned Paul. They dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. After the disciples surrounded him, he got up and went into the town. The next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. Two little verses, and it's funny how casual Scripture is about things sometimes. I mean, Paul got stoned that is real rocks pelting him in the head he went from hero to zero and the disenchanted crowd that worshiped him just a few minutes before are now literally killing him they left him for dead now who does that remind you of who, what are we going to celebrate next week what jesus did on palm sunday just worshiped and adored by the crowds and five days later 
He was hung up on a cross. He was hung up on a, cr- a tree. You know, I love big crowds. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, we got a good crowd here at church today. I'm happy about that. I'm hoping for a big crowd at Easter. I love big crowds. Uh, I wish we could knock this thing down and build two or three more like it and, 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 and reach thousands and thousands of people. I'm not anti-big crowd. But the truth is, crowds can be very fickle, can't they? Just ask Tim Tebow. Crowds can be very fickle. When pretty boy Peyton Manning shows up, he is yesterday's news in a hurry, isn't he? Just ask the guy or the girl that was number one 30 years ago, the number one tennis player 30 years ago. Does anybody know who that is? The number one singer, the number one actor, the number one whoever. They're an afterthought now. Crowds are fickle. Assuming that Paul is dead, the mob leaves him, and the terrified disciples gather around him. Most likely, they're praying for him, and he revives. This is amazing stuff here, folks. This may have been when Paul had his vision of the third heaven, recorded in 2 Corinthians 12. And you just think about this this man who was so eloquent and such a great writer, and God used him to do so much. He just got stoned to death. But somehow he either died and rose from the, uh, back alive, or he wasn't quite all the way dead. Either way, there must have been a massive healing that went on in his body to enable him to get up and walk around. Listen, don't be surprised by trouble. Don't be shocked when trials come your way, when tribulation and turmoil comes. You should expect it and trust that God will help you through it. And sometimes I can say that so casually. Just We just read Paul's story. He got stunned. He died. He rose up. Listen, it's not that casual when it's you, is it? It's not that casual when it's it's your child in in the hospital room that you would gladly give your life for if you could. It's it's definitely not that casual for you when the phone rings and it's like, why are they calling me from out of town in the middle of the day or in the middle of the night? You know it's not good news. Listen, it's not easy. But you have your heavenly father and that plane's just going all over the place. But your your father's the pilot and he's going to get you through it. Do you remember the story of Horatio Spafford? A 43-year-old Chicago businessman suffered financial disaster in the Chicago fires of 1871. He and his wife were still grieving the death of one of their children, and he decided to send them to England for a, a, a revival with D.L. Moody. His wife and his um, four daughters went ahead on the SS uh, Ville du Havre, and he planned to follow them afterward in a few days. But on the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was struck by an iron sailing vessel, and it sank. Within 12 minutes, 260, 226 souls perished in that, in that event, including the Spafford's four daughters. The wife survived. And when the survivors were brought to the shore at Cardiff, Wales, Mrs. Spafford cabled her husband, two words, saved alone. Spafford booked passage on the next ship as they were crossing the Atlantic The captain pointed out the place where he thought that the other ship had gone down, where his four daughters perished. That night, Spafford penned these words from the the great hymn, It is well with my soul. When sorrows like sea bellows roll, it is well, it is well with my soul. How could someone go through something like that and write one of the most powerful hymns ever used in in the church through that traumatic event? It's because he he had faith in his father. Romans 5, 2 says, We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope to the point where we can even rejoice when hard times come. So if you're going to successfully complete your mission, you're going to have to be obedient and go where God tells you to go. You're going to have to endure and expect difficulties on the journey. journey. Don't be surprised by them. Lastly, in closing, celebrate the victories God gives you on the journey. Celebrate the victories God gives you on the journey. And, and the blanks there, finish strong, if you're taking notes. Let's finish strong. I've talked to folks today that are just getting started. I had a wonderful time praying with the youth band before church. And realized they have their whole lives in front of them. I've, not long later, I talked to a, a sweet senior who said, man, I'm getting sore and I'm getting tired. And, 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 and you don't know how much longer you have. None of us do. Let's finish strong. And let's celebrate the victories that God gives us on the journey. We need to do a better job of celebrating our victories as a church, as individuals. We just need to do a better job, not bragging. Don't brag. Don't tell everybody how great your life is, especially when theirs is is difficult. (laughs) 
That's not the, really the time to run your mouth about, you know, your big tax refund or something. Okay? But celebrating the victories that God gives us. Every single person that's ever gotten saved here, God led that person. God saved that person. We led them. We were used to lead them to Jesus. Every good thing that's happened, and there are so many, so many good things to praise the Lord and thank the Lord and worship the Lord and acknowledge him. Why are we so reserved? Why are we so casual? Why are we so laid back in our praise and so aggressive? And, 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 and if they cut your check, your paycheck this week by 10% accidentally, would that get your attention? Yeah, I think it would, wouldn't it? Why are we so casual about the things of God and often apathetic in our praise? Heard about a little boy who was praying for dinner and it was not his favorite day of the week for dinner and it was kind of burnt and it wasn't looking so great. And he said, Lord, I don't like the looks of it, but I thank you for it anyway. That's pitiful. Sometimes we're like that little boy. We're just unthankful. We're ungrateful. Man, we need to celebrate the good things that God is doing in our lives. They traveled 60 miles southeast and successfully evangelized the people of Derby. Then they'd retrace their steps and swing back through Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, Pisidia, and Perga. They provide training for the new believers and appoint new leaders for the churches that they had planted, and they pray with them and fast with them. And you can read verses 23 through 27 to talk about that. What they do here is set a powerful example for following up on those we lead to Christ. Paul would visit these same towns in future missionary journeys. He was proud of them. He was proud of what God accomplished in them, and he followed up on them. And he saw they got followed up on individual, and we can never forget that. And when we reach people next week and the week after, don't fall asleep at the switch. Don't, that, that's not the time to relax and take a vacation. Come back and let's follow up on them. Let's plug them into a Bible study class on Sunday or Wednesday. Let, let's, let's help folks and disciple them. Verse 26, the team returns to Antioch and reports to the church all that had happened, specifically what God did among, among the Gentiles. Mission accomplished. Let's look at verse 26 together. From there they sailed back to Antioch, the original Antioch, Antioch by the sea, where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work they had completed. In my line of work, it never feels like everything's done. I'm always stressed out about the next thing, and the next event, and the next person, the next meeting, and the next day. I, but I got to tell you, it, it feels good to know that in Scripture, this man and, his, and his, his team completed their mission. I desperately want to complete the mission God has given me. I desperately want to do that. I hope that today you will make a commitment to doing that. Start strong, but finish stronger. Finish the job and always give God the glory for what he does. He will give you everything you need to successfully complete your mission that he's given you. Not the one, the one that you've adopted, the thing that's so important and so great to you, that may mean very, that probably means very little to him. Hobbies and fun and all the stuff we, we waste our time with. God will give you everything you need to successfully complete his mission for you. He wants us to rely on him, not ourselves. He, he wants us to, be, uh, to, to have peace, not to be stressed out and anxious and, and fearful and defeated. He provides peace and comfort, encouragement, strength, healing and victory. And if that's what you need today, I'll just encourage you to, to accept it. In fact, I'd ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now and say, Lord, give me your peace. I know that the mission you've given me, the mission you've given me, I can't do it on my own, but through your strength, I can do all things. The little chorus, the kids are going to come back and sing this little chorus. It is well, it is well. Through the storm, I am held. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well. God has won. Christ prevail is it well with you today if not i invite you to take your needs to jesus right now this is the time of response this is the time of reflection for each and every one of us to consider what is it exactly that god is leading you to do are there areas of disobedience in your life that you need to hand over to him today have you been dealing with some difficulties that you just want to lay down at the altar come and lay them down at the altar and leave them leave them there leave them with your savior trust him and ask him for endurance. Maybe he hasn't chosen to heal you yet, physically, the way you wish he would. Maybe you're having to go through things that don't have a quick solution, and you know that. Ask for strength to endure and celebrate the victories God gives you. 
celebrate the victories that he's brought into your life, into your family, into your church, into your class, into your relationships. And I want to encourage you today, finish strong. We, we need to get started with some things, but we need to start them, and we need to understand it's a, it's a marathon, and I want to finish strong. I want to encourage you to finish strong. God in heaven, I pray that you would move mightily during our time of invitation. Help us to grapple with these truths in your word. Thank you so much that Paul and Bartimaeus completed their mission. Lord, help us to complete the mission you've given us. Help us to stay on task. Help us to stay on point. Help us to stay on message. Help us not to get distracted by preferential issues and and stuff that doesn't really matter, especially the petty stuff. Lord, don't let the petty stuff trip us up. Please don't let the petty stuff threaten and damage our unity, our harmony as a church. Forgive us for we've allowed, anytime we've allowed that to happen. Lord God, I pray that you would motivate us today more than ever to finish strong, to be obedient, to go where you tell us to go, and to to, to prepare for, for difficulty on the journey, and to celebrate, and to worship you, and to praise you for every single victory you give us along the way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? You can sing along with the band, the parts you know. If you have a burden in your heart and you want to take and give it to the Lord, do that. If you, if you want to join our church or request baptism or anything like that, if you want to be born again, come forward and request it. If there's something we can pray for you about, you're invited to come and do that now.
Thank you guys for joining us in worship. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. I thank you for just the opportunity that we have to come together and worship you and lift up your name and praise you, Lord. And we just um, thank you for what you are doing in people's hearts and what you are doing in people's lives. And Lord, we thank you for your word today that was preached. Lord, I pray that you would continue to convict hearts, that you would continue to move and that people would recognize your will and they would follow it to the ends of the earth. In your name I pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed.